the Epistle for the fourth Sunday of Lent is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 4. Brother, it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a slave woman and the other by a free woman. But he was of the of this slave woman was born according to the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise, which things are said by an allegory. For these are the two testaments, the one from Mount Sinai, engendering unto bondage, which is Agar, for Sinai is a mountain in Arabia which has affinity to that Jerusalem which now is, and is in bondage with her children. So he's talking here about the slavery of the Jewish religion. They are, they are slaves now to their empty ceremonies, and uh, it's dead. The Jewish religion is dead, and for any Catholic to participate in any Jewish ceremony, such as uh, 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 bishop or cardinal, um, uh, the Pope Francis, before he was Pope, when he participated in these Jewish ceremonies, these are serious mortal sins. Uh, when the U.S. Council of Bishops proclaims that the Jewish covenant of the Old Testament is still valid. These are blasphemies against the redemption, against Christ, against God. So this is what St. Paul is talking about. But that Jerusalem which is above is free, which is our mother. And that's the Catholic Church. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren, that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that, <coughs> that, thou that prevail, travailest not. For many are the children of the desolate, more than of her that has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born according to the flesh persecuted him that was after the Spirit, so also it is now. And he's saying how the Jews always persecute the Catholic Church and seek to destroy and root out our Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> down to today. But what says the Scripture? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not the children of the slave woman. We're not the Jews. We're not subject to the Jewish ceremonies anymore. But of the free, by the freedom wherewith Christ has made us free. The Holy Gospel. Stand up. St. John, chapter 6. At that time Jesus went over to the Sea of Galilee, which is that of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw the miracles which he did on them that were diseased. Jesus therefore went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Pasch, the festival day of the Jews, was near at hand. When Jesus therefore had lifted up his eyes, and saw that a very great multitude came to him, he said to Philip, From where shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to try him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, says to him, There is a boy here that has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are these among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, and the men said, therefore sat down in number about 5,000. So that's 5,000 men, and the Jews only counted the men. So you're talking probably another 5,000 women, plus the children. So perhaps it was easily over 10,000 people here. But 5,000 men. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed it to them that were set down. In like manner also of the fish, as much as they would eat. And when they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, lest they be lost. They gathered up therefore and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the fire barley loaves, which remained over and above to them that had eaten. Now those men, when they had seen what a miracle Jesus had done, said, This is of a truth the prophet that is to come into the world. <coughs> Jesus therefore, when he knew that they would come to take him by force and make him king, fled again into the mountain, himself alone. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. Okay. 
by way of announcement, please to con continue to pray for our uh, seminary, Our Lady of Mount Carmel Seminary in Boston, Kentucky. And uh, we have nine that are studying to be priests. Pray for them all. And this is only our second year. And I uh, also want to thank everybody who in any way has helped our sent down clothes, which was a recent request. And uh, any support for the seminary, especially your prayers. It is an important work that there be priests formed and trained for Catholic tradition. So continue to pray for that. Also, um, there are numerous websites that are now springing up that have become great vehicles to convey the Catholic truth, to convey the Catholic teaching, to understand the, the fight we're in, the crisis, the battle we're in for the faith. And uh, I often list a few of them. And uh, the, of course, there's the Recusant out of England, uh, Trad Cat Knight. Um, that's a very good website. He's got plenty of good talks from Father Hess and the Resistance Priest, Bishop Williamson, and so forth. Um, also, uh, Hugh Aiken's um, Catholic Action Resource Center. You can look that one up as well, Catholic Action Resource Center. Hugh Aikens is, uh, is an old uh, warrior in the fight, and he's uh, president of the League of Christ the King. And, um, and I encourage you also, among you, to, especially the men, to gather together, form a core to study the writings of the great popes. To, to, uh, we have to turn our minds. All our minds are so twisted and infected and contaminated by modern liberalism. We got we got over 400 years of poison in our blood with the uh, liberal republic constitutions and the, the uh, separation of church and state and the freedom of the press and the freedom of, to teach what you want and the freedom of this and the freedom of that. And all these freedoms lead to the glorious, in the liberal's mind, freedom to kill their own baby by the thousands every day. This is happening in the Western countries every day by abortion. And now the so-called freedom and right to die, euthanasia, and assisted suicide, which was that passed in Canada after all? Not yet. Not yet? Well, the, the, the monster liberals are working on it. And uh, it's, it's logical in the liberal revolution that they will pass it because there's no stopping the avalanche of revolution. The only stop the only way to stop it is Christ crucified in the Catholic faith. That's the only solution to the crumbling Western nations. So, um, <clears throat> Hugh Aikens has also put out a very good book all of you should be familiar with, Synagogue Rising. It has all the papal documents talking about the Freemasonry and the Judeo-Masons. This is not the boogeyman hiding in the closet. This is men who are... From, from the time of St. Paul, from the time of St. Paul, wherever St. Paul went, the Jews would stir trouble and, and even persecution and a whole mob against him. They were always fighting him every step of the way. And the, the Jews, the Judeo-Masons have always, this, this is called what St. Paul calls the synagogue of Satan. They are vowed to destroy any vestige of Christ on the earth especially Catholicism and Christendom. They hate monarchy. They hate Catholic monarchy. They hate the Catholic Crusades. They hate Catholic truth. They hate the Catholic sacraments. They hate Catholic tradition. And they are, they are more zealous to destroy Christ than we are to spread Him. And they are unified. They are organized. Their members don't sleep much. They work hard. They're communists, they're Freemasons, they're, they're agents, and they, they put us to shame. And here we are chasing butterflies and wondering what we're going to eat and put on. When our Lord told us, don't worry about these things. Focus on what's essential. And so, those are some websites that can help a lot. 
Um, and there's other ones I'm not mentioning. I can't remember them all. 469 Fitter. Uh, 469 Pipe Fitter. 469 Fitter. That one has a, a lot of uh, sermons of the priests. Which I, I see now the internet can be a great highway, like, like the Roman roads were the highway for St. Paul and the Apostles to spread the Catholic faith. The new highways now are the internet to spread the Catholic faith. Of course, it's, there's a ton of filth, a ton of heresies and errors out there. But for those of good will and good hearts, there is the true Catholic doctrine that they can find. In true writings of St. Thomas Aquinas, the Fathers of the Church, the encyclicals of the great popes, and all of the Archbishop, and you, all of you, especially you kids too, you should hear the sermon of Archbishop Lefebvre when he preached at the consecration of bishops on June 30th, 1988. You weren't even born yet. So uh, you should hear that sermon and read it. It's very powerful. And three times in that sermon, Archbishop Lefebvre says, we must never make an agreement with Rome, nor some foolish so-called recognition, until Rome comes back to the faith. It is that simple. It is that simple. So, <clears throat> those things are all available on the internet. And uh, use it, use it, use it. Use it. But use it wisely and sparingly. <coughs> The important thing is that we grow in the love of God and virtue. So those are some websites. Pray for the seminary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Here we are in the fourth Sunday of Lent. St. Paul is already drawing from Scripture and explaining it. And St. Thomas Aquinas, in his day, there was quite a battle. Aristotle taught that the earth could be eternal that the whole universe and all its movements could be eternal. And St. Thomas said, no, because we know by the authority of Revelation, in the book of Genesis, the first verse, in the beginning God created heaven and earth. Just the word of God outweighs all the philosophers and all the guesses and thinking of mankind. One word of God revealed in Revelation, that is scripture and tradition, outweighs all the rest. Because God's authority outweighs all the authority of Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, even though these men might be good and they have brought a lot. And St. Thomas Aquinas actually baptizes them. That is, he takes their wisdom uh, and, and brings it into the Catholic vision of things built on Christ. So... <clears throat> So the one word of Scripture outweighs it all, all the rest. And one word of the book of Genesis outweighs all the stupidity of modern science and all their dreams and all their efforts to pry, try to prove that uh, little uh, Sean here, his great-great ancestor, was some ape hanging from a tree. And this is being taught as doctrine in all the public schools. Any, any museum you go to that has archaeology, 4.5 billion years ago, uh, this rock was here and whatever. It's just pure fantasy. It's, it's pure fantasy of, of these scientists. But one word of God outweighs all these fools. Fools who raise their science against the wisdom of God. And the more science is honest, the more they, they discover, hey, the rocks still contain uranium from the first moment of their creation. And it's still caught like a photograph caught. And uh, the dust on the moon is really not all that thick, billions of years. There should be mountains and mountains of dust. But there's only a thin layer of dust, which tells you the universe actually is, is no older than 6,000 years old. It's young. And then the Noah's Flood, the, the Great Grand Canyon, which is an open book of the flood of Noah. And you have uh, trees that are petrified, uh, cutting through layers and layers and layers of sediment. And according to these foolish evolutionists, it's billions and billions of years to get one layer of sediment. Then why is there trees and cutting right through it? And Mount Everest, excuse me, the uh, Mount St. Helens, when it blew in the 80s, 
they discovered that there was oil produced from the heat and the pressure, fossilized trees within weeks from the heat and the pressure. So it's not billions of years. And the more science are, is, is honest, the more they bow down to the Word of God in Genesis. And they have found salt crystals on top of mountains, proving the flood of Noah. They have fossils of fish in a, in a state of catastrophe and panic, mingled in with many trees and plants and other uh, sea life and animal life and even dinosaurs. Dinosaurs, which must have, were certainly in God's plan, but they find these huge bones mixed in with all these other things from a traumatic flood that struck the earth, from the, the fountains of the deep that burst with the power of over 200 nuclear bombs going off. And that, that water from the deep burst and split the continents, and uh, hence the flood. So, in every, in every realm of the earth, there are stories of Noah and the flood, even among the Indians in the United States. So, so all history, says St. Augustine, is a poem written by God to glorify our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything is built to glorify our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Adam, the second Adam. He is the king of the whole human race. Through him all things were made, through the Son, who is consubstantial with the Father and the Holy Ghost. Through him all things were made. And everything is for the glory of the Blessed Trinity. All the universe, all creation. And creation all does it. The animals all glorify him. The planets all glorify him. The, the, the insects glorify him, just doing what they're doing. But who doesn't glorify him? The prince of the earth, mankind. God gave all these things for man, and man use it to, uses it to insult him. Uses his oxygen to breathe, and uses the tongue God gave us to blaspheme his name. And man uses his hands and his feet to uh, build temples of heresy, instead of adoring the true God. So we, we are the ones that always need the spanking of heaven, and we look at the history of the, of the human race, it's really been no different from the fall of Adam and Eve and the whole history of the Israelites. Now, this is, uh, this is all, all the, everything in the Old Testament, all the human history from Adam and Eve to Christ, all of it, everything in the Old Testament is, a sh is the Old Testament is like the shadow, the New Testament is the reality. Everything in the Old Testament, including even the, the, the men, the figures, and the, and the women, like Judith, they all have a direct connection to Christ. Everything prepares and points to Christ. So, I'm not going to go through the whole Old Testament, but just a few examples. The, the Paschal Lamb. After the God had punished the Israelites with with the plagues of Egypt, and Moses could not dissuade the Pharaoh to release the Israelites. God ordered them the last plague, which was the angel of, called the exterminator. The exterminator. The, there's an actual angel called, his job is extermination. And with a sword he killed all the firstborn, animals, and children and adults of the Egyptians. But the Israelites who had killed the lamb, a one-year-old spotless lamb, and ate the meat and smeared its blood on the doorposts of their house, and they had to eat the meat with bitter herbs, and all this has connection to Christ. The lamb, Christ, the true lamb, innocent lamb, Christ is innocent without sin. His blood the redemption, sparing the Israelite homes from being visited by the exterminating angel, the blood of Christ, sparing. So it was the, the blood of the Lamb 
that they smeared in the flesh that they ate, and they had to eat dressed for traveling. And the Israelites fled out of Egypt, and when, they, when Moses came to the Red Sea, they said, we're trapped now. And God, God directed Moses, take your staff, the wooden staff, which appears a lot in the Old Testament. David will carry a wooden staff to kill Goliath. The Moses' wooden staff many times shows up. The wooden staff prefigures the cross. And Moses touches the water with it. The waters divide miraculously with two walls of water on each side. And the Israelites, the ground is dry and they walk across. And there they have found, archaeologists have found in that part of the Red Sea, uh, after the, the walls of water crushed the Egyptians and all their armies, they have found the swords, they have found chariot wheels of the Egyptians with eight spokes, the way they built them, chariot seats, uh, pieces of the horse, uh, chain mail. All this is found, and some of it's still there, sitting there gro with growing... Uh, uh, moss and fungus on it, but it's there. And this, as all of the fathers of the church, this is real history, it really happened. But the way God writes his poetry of history, it all points to Christ. And so the Lamb is Christ crucified, the Egyptians are the, uh, are the persecution of the devils, and the state of sin. The crossing of the Red Sea, that is the cross of redemption, on Jesus on dying on the cross, enables us to pass from the state of sin to the state of grace, from the state of slavery to the state of freedom. And the true freedom is the state of grace. The true slavery is the state of sin. And that's one of the biggest deceptions of the devil for modern man. All the modern governments, all the modern thinking is freedom. I can do what I want, think what I want, believe as I want, which we don't have the right to. I can treat my baby the way I want that I don't want. I can kill my old people, my old, my old man the way I want because he wants to, he's going to die anyway. We can kill off the handicapped and the cri handicapped <coughs> and the crippled, even in the mother's womb now. In the name of liberty and freedom, this false freedom. This Masonic idea of freedom, which is false, and it leads, it drips with blood, and it leads to the true slavery and the police state where we're headed directly to as a punishment for our, our throwing off the kingship of Christ, for the slavery of Satan. And so the true uh, liberty, the true freedom is that of the children of God, the Catholic truth and the state of grace. That's freedom. That's happiness. And true pleasure, true joyful living is the virtuous life. And guess who even says this? Guess who even says the happy life is the virtuous life? You might be surprised. It's a man who never heard of the name of Christ. He lived about 300 years before Christ. He was a pagan. His name was Aristotle. And the modern man today, you ask an average guy in the street, what's happiness of this life? Oh, well, party it up, living like a pig, getting drunk, living in fornication, and uh, drugs, and marijuana, and doing what I want. And That's the modern man, modern pagans. But Aristotle is a pagan. And you know what he says the happy life is? The virtuous life. To honor your parents. And these guys are pagans to be honest in business, to use the pleasures God gave you, use them moderately. Aristotle was all about that, moderation, and, uh, and so forth. The, the, and he was a pagan, Aristotle. So the, the crossing of the Red Sea means the state from slavery of sin to the freedom to the state of grace. And that's... <coughs> And all this points to Christ, because Moses himself prefigures Christ, and Christ, disputing with the Jews, will tell them, Moses spoke of me, he said. And it's true, Moses many times mentions the prophet that is to come. And uh, also when the Israelites 
finally did cross. And they started complaining. Moses, did you lead us out in the desert to die? And there are times when God says to him, Moses, step out of the way because I want to destroy these people. They have offended me. They have turned from me. Let me at them. The anger of God is about to be unleashed on the Israelites. And what does Moses do? Like Christ, he lays down prostrate on the ground. Oh God, spare your people. Remember how you led them out of Egypt. Remember all you did for them. Remember you, how you loved these people. And God would soften his heart and turn and say, Okay, Moses, I will spare these people because of you. And that prefigures Christ on the cross, who because of him <coughs> spares us all from being condemned to hell. Because by sin, and even by just original sin, we could never see the face of God. But our Lord, like the true Moses, has, has pleaded mercy for our sake. Every time we go to confession, who forgives you? It's not the priest. It's the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. The priest is just pouring out to you the love of the Sacred Heart and washing your soul with his blood. And then what happens? The Israelites start complaining. You know, we're starving. We, I wish we could go back to Egypt and get the onions there. We had food at least there. And so Moses turns to God and says, Lord, what do I do? They're hungry. And God answers and says, there's a, sends a whole flock of quails. You know, fresh turkey. You just got to cook it. And uh, they feasted. And then God fed them every day of the 40 years in the desert. Do you know what he fed them every day? Taking care of them like a mother every day. It was called the manna. Manu in Hebrew means, what is this? They would wake up in the morning and find man, manna everywhere. And it, it was something like a, a, a very supersonic vitamin packed, nutrient packed rice crispy that was tasted like honey and flour. It was really delicious, very rich. And they, could have, they had to gather it in the morning, only enough for each person. If someone got greedy and tried to gather double the portion, his, the, the worms would appear and eat it and rot it. And all, every detail of this prefigures, take a guess. Christ is going to say it, St. John chapter 6. God fed, God fed the Israelites, your fathers, with manna in the desert. But the bread I give you, if you eat of this bread, you will never hunger again. And will give you eternal life. Well, what is this bread? And Christ tells them, Saint, this very gospel of today, this, this bread, I am the living bread that has come down from heaven. Who eats this bread and, and drinks this blood will not die, but shall have eternal life. Well, what is this bread? What is it? And Christ speaks very Catholic. In other words, very clearly. The bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh and my blood. What? You're a cannibal. What are you talking about eating your flesh? And they all walked away, disgusted and horrified, calling him a fanatic, crazy. And our Lord Jesus Christ, does he change? Does he compromise the Catholic truth? Does he say, oh, come back, I really meant it's, a, it's just a moral sense. It's only allegorical. No, Christ is very literal. And he lets them walk away. And how many down the centuries, including modern Protestants and Baptists and so-called Christians, walk away because this, this word is too heavy. But it shows the extreme love of God, the Holy Eucharist. And when our Lord turns to the apostles, what does he say to them? Are you going to leave me too? He does not compromise the Catholic faith. He does not compromise the Catholic faith. And because he is the truth. And so the apostles, of course, stay. And then, uh, so God feeds them manna. And then they're thirsty. And after a few days crossing the Red Sea, and they come to a huge lake. And all the Israelites, like, like a pack of a thirsty uh, hockey team coming off the bench or a football team after a hot practice, they start jumping in the water and drinking it and drinking it and they spit it out and it tastes so bitter. And they say, here we are, we can't even drink this water, we're dying of thirst. 
Moses, you brought us out here. The whole list of complaints. So Moses turns to God and says, Lord, what do we do? And God tells Moses, take a tree, one of the trees, throw it into the lake. And they do it. And the lake suddenly becomes drinkable, fresh, sweet water to drink. Which prefigures, again, the cross of Christ, turning the bitterness of this, of our of our sin, of our souls, of this life, into sweetness. Come to me, all you who labor and are burdened. And there's no greater burden than our own sins and the crosses of this life. And I will refresh you, for my yoke is sweet, my burden, my, my burden is light, and my yoke is sweet. And then the, the, the great story of the Rock of Contradiction of, at Mount Horeb. And today there is this huge rock which is kind of divided in the middle. It's standing there in the desert, in the middle of the desert, and there's signs, clear signs of erosion of water. And it's there that God instructed Moses, strike, talk to the rock, tell the rock what I will tell you, and it will give water for the, for the people. Moses doesn't trust God, and he strikes it with the rock instead, excuse me, with his rod, instead. And God says, because you doubted me, you will not enter the promised land, you and Aaron. So, so out of the, once the rock is struck, the water pours out. And this, everything in the Old Testament prefigures Christ. And the fathers of the church say, Christ is the rock, and this rock was struck on the cross, and out of his sacred wounds, and especially his sacred heart, poured out the flood of graces for us to drink. That's going to happen in this Mass right now. St. Leo the Great says, the priest stands at the altar. He stands before the rock, which is Christ. And with the staff of the cross and the twofold words of consecration, he strikes the rock, which is Christ, reenacting the sacrifice of Calvary. And in the Mass gushes out the flood of graces. For each soul, filling you, depending how thirsty you are. For those who don't care and just yawn and don't care to be at Mass and to love God, they don't get much. But those, those hearts that open wide and are thirsty, God <laughs> fills with His grace. So everything in the Old Testament prefigures Christ. Everything points to Him. And when Jews convert, such as Edith Stein, such as the famous Jewish rabbi in Rome, who received death threats at the day of his baptism, because he was baptized under Pius XII, and uh, that was a big scandal for the Jews that this rabbi would convert to Catholicism. And Pius XII was the one who led him to the truth. And when they convert, these Jews, they everything makes sense to them. It's like all the, the gears finally kick in and it all makes sense because it's all the Old Testament points to Christ, everything about it. And so on Good Friday, this is going to be the words of the church to all of us because <coughs> and it's the words of our Lord. My people, what have I done to thee or in what way have I grieved thee? Answer me. Because I brought you out of the land of Egypt, and we were brought out of the slavery of sin by our baptism, or by confession, thou hast prepared a cross for thy Savior. I led thee out through the desert forty years, and fed thee with manna, and for us Catholics, he put us in the life of grace, to know the Catholic Catechism, to know the truth. And he fed us with the manna that is his own body and blood, his soul and divinity in the Holy Eucharist. How often we go to communion. How often. And we can make spiritual communions every day. Many times a day. And I brought thee into a land exceedingly good. But thou hast prepared a cross for thy Savior. What more ought I to do for thee that I have not done? I planted thee indeed, my chosen, and my, my most beautiful vineyard, and thou hast become exceedingly bitter to me, for in my thirst thou gavest me vinegar to drink, 
and with a spear thou hast pierced the side of thy Saviour. We have all done this by our sins. Spit on Christ, stabbed him, kicked him. For thy sake I scourged Egypt with its firstborn, killing the firstborn with the angel the exterminator. And thou hast scourged me and delivered me up. I brought thee out of Egypt, having drowned Pharaoh in the, in the Red Sea. And thou hast delivered me to the chief priests. I opened the Red Sea before thee, and thou with a spear hast opened my side. I, I went before thee in a pillar of cloud, and that cloud is, says St. Augustine, is the Holy Eucharist, present in the tabernacles. And thou hast brought me to the judgment hall of Pilate. I fed thee with the manna in the desert, the Holy Eucharist for us, in this forty year that is this pilgrimage on earth to the promised land of heaven. And thou hast beaten me with blows and scourges. I gave thee the water of salvation, that is all the sacraments, all the graces. We can pray to God any time, and he will give you the grace. You can try to call your, your prime minister, good luck. You're going to have to get through tons and tons of bureaucracy and uh, a ring around with all numbers to call. You're never going to reach him. But with God, we just raise our heart. We speak to the he creator of heaven and earth, the true redeemer. This is so easy. I gave thee the water of salvation from the rock to drink, and thou hast given me gall and vinegar. For thee I struck the kings of the Canaanites, that is, the wars that the Israelites met, and how many obstacles Christ has removed for us. How many of us should be lost in heresy or in the novice ordo? or uh, in mortal sin. St. Teresa said, I didn't, she never committed mortal sin in her life. And she said the reason was because Christ removed from her the obstacles, otherwise she would have. <laughs> so, I, uh, so he removed the obstacles. And thou hast struck my head with a reed. I gave thee a royal scepter, that is for us sanctifying grace. And thou hast given my, to my head a crown of thorns. I have exalted thee with great power, and thou hast hanged me on the gibbet of the cross. My people, what have I done to thee, or in what way have I offended thee? Answer me. And these are the complaints of the Sacred Heart to his Catholic people. So, dear faithful, we, we must have this Catholic vision Everything is built on Christ. Everything must be restored to Him. Everything. The political level, the economic, social order, everything. Entertainment, education, universities, the police force, the firemen, politicians. Everything must be, lawyers, doctors, everything must be reordered to Christ the King. And that's what it means when we talk about a Catholic state, a Catholic society. And we're seeing the Western world just collapsing before our eyes. And now Catholic tradition, uh, Rome has fallen, hijacked by these modernists. And where is the Catholic Church? Where is the Catholic Church? Is it the Church of Rome? Is it the marble halls of Rome? Yes, we have the Pope. We have the Pope dressed in white. But is, is, is he leading the Catholic Church? Is he feeding the Catholic people? Not Pope Francis, and not any of these Vatican II popes. We ask for bread, and they, they give us scorpions and snakes. We ask for true doctrine, and they, they, they respond with punishments and suspensions and excommunications for Catholic tradition. This is how they treated Archbishop Lefebvre. This is how they treated even recently, last year, the most conservative Novus Ordo Franciscans, and they've been just dismantled completely. They were going towards the Latin Mass, they were going towards tradition, and he's put a stop to that. So we are facing, we are facing in our time the hijacking of the Catholic Church, the corruption at the very top. We have one Pope over two churches. In the old days it was 
uh, two popes over one church, or three popes, the antipopes. But we got one pope over two churches. The Catholic Church, because he is the pope and we acknowledge his authority, we pray for him. But he's also head of this conciliar church. And we want nothing to do with the conciliar church. And this is where Bishop Fillet is leading. Listen to the words of Father Fluger, and I'm wrapping it up here. Father Fluger, the first assistant general of the Society of Pius X, has come to this conclusion. This is October 16th, 2012, when he said, and he hasn't changed. He's the right-hand man of Bishop Fillet. For our part, he says, we suffer also from a defect, the fact of our canonical irregularity. The status of the post-conciliar church is imperfect, nor is our status the ideal. There is no denying the obligation to take an active part in overcoming the crisis. And this combat begins with us by desiring to overcome our abnormal canonical status. Since when are we in an abnormal status? It's not we who are outside the church. It's not traditional Catholics who are outside the church. It's those modernists who are outside the church. Because they have changed the faith. They have abandoned the true Catholic faith. And Father Fluger is saying, <coughs> we're abnormal, we've got to get back in with the church. But what church? The conciliar? Absolutely not. The Catholic church? Yes. But not until Rome comes back to tradition. And this is the new position. And that's why the Dominican nuns led a thousand girls into Rome, and I had nieces among them. And uh, these, these, these Dominican nuns marching under Father Fluger uh, and going to Rome to pray. There's no problem with that, especially to pray for Rome's conversion. But it was all in the light of this hopeful reuniting of the SSPX with, with the modernists. This, and as one bishop says in the interview, it's all steps towards the reconciliation. Reconciliation with who? Listen to this. Therefore, for the first assistant to Bishop Fillet, our principal role in the present crisis of the Church does not consist essentially in professing the faith and combating the errors that oppose the faith and denouncing the scandals that destroy the faith. But the first purpose of the society now, since the new direction, is in seeking a canonical status in the conciliar church. There's the deception. This is exactly the opposite of what Archbishop Lefebvre never ceased to affirm. And I quote to you, Archbishop Lefebvre. Here it is. The canonical question, this purely exterior public question in the church is secondary. What is important is to stay in the Catholic Church. That is to stay, that is, to stay in the Catholic faith of all times, and in the true priesthood, and in the true Mass, and in the true sacraments, and in the Catechism of all times, and in the Bible of all times. That is the Church. So being publicly recognized that is secondary, Archbishop Lefebvre. And, uh, and yet Bishop Follet, Bishop Follet himself believes we are in an abnormal situation. He said this, we are not... Uh, um, Bishop Tissier, rather, who said in front of Bishop Follet, we are not in an abnormal situation, Bishop Tissier speaking, but in an exceptional situation. Meaning, exceptional, because Rome has lost the faith. And Archbishop Lefebvre, I conclude with this, he said again, one can say that those people in Rome, and he knew these people in Rome, he saw them eye to eye, he sat with Cardinal Ratzinger and many of these cardinals and bishops, and with popes of Vatican II. One can say that those people in Rome are antichrists. That is, they work against the kingship of Christ. We don't have to worry about the reactions of those people. We are not dealing with honest people. And yet Bishop Follet, in this last letter, praises the so-called prophetic wisdom of Pope Benedict XVI, which is Cardinal Ratzinger. And he is not an honest man. He's one of the head destroyers, engineers of the destruction of the Catholic Church. So, dear faithful, we must, uh, 
we must fight on. And we must, this, this, this time was foretold that we are in. And you are all meant to fulfill a great role in these days. If God has put you in these times, that means you are to be the saints of these times. And God has given you all the grace and all the weapons to persevere, to keep the faith and spread the faith in these times. So we cannot follow the new direction of the SSPX. We cannot. It's, it's going to self-destruction. They have bound themselves in the documents. The proofs are all so numerous. And so what do we do? We must hold fast to Catholic tradition and uh, pray for Bishop Williamson, who has a great role to play in these times too. He's under a lot of pressure, but pray for him, that he does what is necessary for a bishop to do to continue the true faith and the true Mass. When will this situation be over? When will Rome come back to tradition? God knows. The Arian crisis lasted over 150 years. The crisis with the, the Eastern Orthodox lasted hundreds of years. And many Catholics, like in Scotland, and Ireland, and in Wales, had to be hunted down for over 100 years. So we're only 50 years in this battle. 50 something, 51 or two years. We're, all, we're still fresh. How long will this go? God knows. But we just must persevere and battle on. So let's ask the Blessed Mother to give us that grace. Because it is a grace to keep the faith. And any of us can lose it. And uh, remember, even Moses could not enter the Promised Land. Even he was forbidden to enter. And it was Joshua, and Joshua, Yeshua, in Hebrew means Jesus, the Savior. And Joshua prefigured Christ, who led the Israelites, the, the last of them, into the, the Holy Land. That is the Promised Land for the Jews back then, not, not today, but back then. And so that prefigured Christ, leading all, his, all those to be redeemed, into the, the heavenly Jerusalem, the true promised land for which we labor here on earth and we make our pilgrimage in this passing journey to heaven. So let's uh, ask the Mother of God to grant us that grace of perseverance. O Mary, conceived without sin. O Mary, conceived without sin. O Mary, conceived without sin. O Father, Son, Holy Ghost.